it's a pleasure and an honor to be here and and uh, some of us in this room have known each other before some of the others in this room have been born so it's not easy to grow old and keep giving this talk but i hope i can i can get you something out of the talk and and the question really i think still remains where did we go wrong and why is this still so wrong but i want to set the stage um in, in the mid-90s, steroids were a really hot topic and, and very widely practiced. And this kind of was, was what was happening at the time. In the Civil Court of California at Pomona Valley Hospital in 1987, there was a, a child born with a high forceps delivery. And he was transferred to the Loma Linda Hospital, diagnosed with spinal cord injury five days postpartum. Now, what came out in the trial was that the the child was actually born with the head rotated 180 degrees on the neck from the high forceps delivery. And then, of course, when the, when the child was born, they rotated the neck back. The child was quadriplegic, ventilator dependent, and in the court, negligence was the charge with cause and aggravation of injury. There was, at that time, a huge settlement, $13 million. The um, delivering obstetrician was assessed 5.2 million or 40% of the damages. And the two intensive care doctors that looked after the child at Pomona Valley Hospital were assessed 60% of the blame, totaling $8 million. And the whole trial was really pivoted on the testimony of two experts, neurologists, um, not, not orthopedic surgeons, not neurosurgeons, but neurologists, who both testified that if steroids had been given, there was a greater than not chance that the patient would be walking at this day and age. The case was heard under appeal near the year 2000, and the damages were reassessed, and, and the, the two um, ICU people found guilty as well. So that's where we were back when this all became a really big deal. It's not as big now. Uh, and, and I'm thankful for that, and I hope by the time we're done here, I can give you some comfort with this uh, in, in, in saying what you, what you believe rather than what you think you need to say. But if we look at the, the literature as it exists right now, there are five class one studies, which means prospective randomized. There are three class two studies, which means cohort case controlled. And then there are 10 class three studies, which are retrospective studies. And if you look at these studies, the ones in blue are positive studies, and the ones in red are all negative studies. So the majority of the studies of the 18 are, are negative, and there are a handful of positive ones. So what I want to do is just touch on some of the highlights of the positive ones and give you a feel. Well, ignore the negative ones. Uh, it's not a majority vote here. We're going to try and look at the, the evidence that's positive and uh, see what's wrong with that evidence. So there's three that I want to touch on today. Uh, one class three and two of the class ones. The Kowarski study was published in 1993, and it's a retrospective review out of Poland. It's still one of the largest retrospective reviews of spinal cord injury patients, 620 in all, spanning uh, the years 1976 to 1991. Um, the, they, 290 patients were given methylprednisolone, uh, 330 were given no treatment, and what was interesting is that the dose varied. Uh, it wasn't a standardized dose, but it varied according to the age, weight, medical conditions, what the physician wanted to give. Most usual was eight milligrams TID for uh, several days up to a week. Do you, know, got, do you know what kind of doses were given in NASCIS trials? We are. Yeah, 35 milligrams per kilogram loading, and then 5.4 milligrams per kilogram after that every eight hours. So this, this is just a sniff. Uh, they were admitted to the hospital less than 24 hours and novel neurograding system. It wasn't the Asia score, but be that as it may. How they broke out the results is, is in this way. They looked at the percent of patients that improved. And here you can see broken down into age groups, less than 25, 20, 26 to 50, and age greater than 50. And methylprednisolone is in pink and controls are in blue. And what it shows is there's consistently in all age groups a higher chance that you're going to experience some degree of neurologic improvement if you're given methylprednisolone. Well, here's what's not published, at least not in graphical form. This was kind of hidden between the lines. This is the graph of the percent mortality in the same series. And if you look at 
less than 25, 25 to 60, and greater than 50 age, sorry, 25 to 50, and greater than 50 years old, what you can see is consistently there's at least twice as high mortality rate in the control groups compared to methylprednisolone. So not only is the control group higher injury, higher severity, but they're dying sooner, they've got less follow-up, uh, and, and that pretty much explains the results of the, of the study right there. So that's a problem with, with not just the Kowarski study, but retrospective studies in general. They actually cause more questions than they answer. The Otani study was published in a Japanese journal in 1994. It was translated into English, but never published in English. It's a prospective randomized but not blinded study where the first arm got 30 milligrams per kilogram and then 5.4. This is the NASCIS 2 dosages. Uh, arm 2 got no treatment. There were 158 patients entered, 117 analyzed, and that broke down to 70 and 47. Uh, 40, 70 treated, 47 controlled, six months follow-up. All of the primary analyses were negative, so there was no difference between motor and sensory scores in any of the patients. But on the post hoc analysis, they too decided to look at the percent of patients improved. So once again, methylprednisolone in pink, controls in, in blue, and you can see consistently more a higher percentage of the, of the methylprednisolone groups improved in motor, light touch, and pinprick. But again, what's not published, and what you have to realize when you read this in a little more detail, is if all of the primary outcome measures here, motor and pinprick and light touch score across the entire study follow-up period, if the primary outcomes are negative, and these ones are positive, then the next thing is if you look at the magnitude of the neurologic recovery, even though a smaller percentage of patients improved on the control group, they improved to a greater degree. So the people who didn't get the drug actually consistently had a greater return of recovery. And so when you start to think about it in those terms, it really doesn't make sense. It's, it's a problem when, when you div, dig into the data a little deeper. So what you're actually seeing in the post hoc analysis for Otani is, is a random event that's canceled by, by the opposite effect. Well, that brings us to uh, NASCIS-2, uh, which is what put the industry on, a, on its ear and made us begin to treat this. And we have to look at this a little more closely. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but when it comes to a medication, not a device, but a medication, what would it take for you to prescribe it for your wife, for your children, for your parents, to change your practice pattern on a medication? And I think, I think we could all agree that the, the, the data, the studies that show it to work would have to be well designed, well executed. They'd have to show compelling data, statistical significance with appropriate tests, and appreciable impact on issues that are important to the patient, and they would have to be reproducible. I think that's pretty much common sense. I hope nobody would disagree with that. So if we look at the NASCIS-2 study, the, the six months results were published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1990. The one year results were published in the Journal of Neurosurgery in 1992, and I'll show all of those results compiled here. There were three treatment arms, almost 500 patients randomized, which is really good for, for a neurosurgery, uh, spinal surgery type of, of um, study, this is, this is a huge, huge accomplishment. But once again, unfortunately, all of the primary outcome measures were negative. So this is motor score on the, checked only on the right side. We're not sure why they didn't include the left side data, but not statistically significant throughout the 12 months of follow-up. And here is pinprick, not statistically significant. They didn't show the 12 months of follow-up. They only showed it to the New England Journal article, but not statistically significant. Um, and then here is the light touch. And once again, by the time they got to a year, no effect on, on the light touch. So the primary outcomes are pre-planned, intuitive, and unfortunately negative on this. The post hoc analysis is a search process. As most of you know, it's less powerful, typically reserved for primary outcomes when they're positive. And if we look at the NASCIS-2 study, from the 500 patients, those treated in greater than eight hours, we have to throw out over half the patients and just look at less than half the patients, 200 of them. 66 treated, remember there were three arms, but 66 with methylprednisolone and 69 with placebo. And here are the results. And this is what you see on the sub-analysis, but this is the sub-analysis that changed the course of history. 
uh, blue is methylprednisolone and pink is placebo. I, I just ask you, if you look at those two lines, sensory scores on, on the um, y-axis and months after injuries on the x-axis, do those two lines look different to you? And the answer statistically is at those two points they are, but at one year they're not. Here's pinprick, same thing. Do those lines look different to you? Well, guess what? Statistically, they are in those two periods, but they're not at one year. Here's the motor scores, and are those lines different to you? I would say they don't look that different to me, but as it turns out, if you subtract them from baseline and do just simple ANOVAs on them, they are statistically significant, and that's what caused us to prescribe methylprednisolone. And that's on, as I mentioned, 62 patients. So um, the, the NASCIS-2 results don't really show any internal consistency because it's one observation. There's a trend towards improvement, but in all of the other outcome measures, there's no correlation with any of the other data, uh, including um, bowel and bladder function and, and those kinds of things that were analyzed. Here's where most of the people that still prescribe methylprednisolone get their data from. If you look at Asia C patients, they found in the NASCIS-2 on their sub-analysis 24 point score improvement in people that got methylprednisolone versus 12 that don't. And this is what happens if you take the entire 500 patient cohort and you carve off that analysis I just showed you. You're talking about 12 patients out of 500 that showed a little bit difference, a 22 point improvement compared to 12. So what's the strength of that conclusion? Not very much when you consider, if we look at the complications, which our primary analysis applied to the whole population, there's harmful side effects in four class one studies, including wound infection, hyperglycemia requiring insulin, GI hemorrhage, and death. And these are the studies, class one evidence of a harmful effect, not sub-analysis, but in the, in the entire cohort. NASCIS two and three, GI hemorrhage, 1.5 incidence, higher in, in methylprednisolone treated uh, patients, wound infection, twice as high incidence, pulmonary embolism, three times as high, death, six times as high, almost statistically significant, just underpowered to make that, that conclusion. Sepsis and pneumonia. So if we come back to this and we ask you then, okay, are you gonna give methylprednisolone to your kids, to your parents? Is the data for a drug? Well designed, sure. Is it well executed? Yeah. Is the data compelling? No. Is there statistical significance with appropriate tests? No, there was no comparison. There was no control for multiple comparisons. Is it appreciable impact on issues important to the patient? No. And has it been reproduced? No. So I, I would challenge you then that the, the correct answer is no, I would not give this drug to my, my parents or my kids. Uh, if we look at the NASCIS-3 study, and some of you may be more familiar with that, similarly they found statistical significance at these time points with motor scores if they sub-analyze three to eight hours. But we're losing statistical significance here. Technically 0.053 is not statistically significant. What bothered me a little bit is that there was a 0.056 for the six times more death due to respiratory infection. But the authors still concluded that patients started between three to eight hours should be maintained for four to eight hours. That's with a p-value that's not significant. And they said there may be a possibility of an increased mortality call for caution. That's with a p-value that's almost exactly the same as the one that they're setting the standard of care on. So biased reporting is important and is something to try and, try and be aware of. When we looked at this from a guidelines perspective and we published this as one of the chapters, our conclusion was administration of methylprednisolone is not recommended. Class one and two and three evidence exists that high dose steroids are associated with harmful effects including death. And if you have an opportunity, I think you should just say no. That's right.